you okay? I'm going to ask you a question. And this is for all of us, and this is something we've talked about a few times before, but I don't think we're going to over-talk this in the near future. And here's the question. What does it take to turn? What is your personal method of turning into the Lord? Now, it's not always turning into the Lord. Sometimes it's turning into my own spirit man. In other words, being aware of and engaged with my spirit man. But uh, sometimes it is turning to that. Sometimes it's turning to the face of the Lord. And sometimes it's turning into the heavenly places. But the point is, how do we turn away from natural thinking? Everything that happens between our ears. How do we turn from that? into the spirit realm and become focused or aware of that territory. Yeah. You know, I think most of us start out in the turning point, at the point of turning, is usually predicated or initiated by need. Because most of us are a me, my, mine kind of preoccupation. That's our mind. That's, that's what goes on our mind. You know, it's all about me. And so when we face a need, then we have to call for help. And that, I think, is largely what most of the world is um, motivated by or activated by, by need. But as we grow, as we grow and mature and learn the, the, the wonderful blessing or bliss of His presence, then we learn that there is a uh, practicing his presence, like Brother Lawrence, you know, the old mystic from centuries ago. Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence becomes our, uh, our preferred status rather than only approaching him based on needs. So the maturity, I think, begins to uh, help us to learn new ways. I like it, Teresa, that you say about anything can uh, inspire you to turn. A butterfly, a cloud, a smell. Or how about this? I think we've all had this. I always kind of liken it to a little tug, a little tug on the inside of me that I liken to something like homesickness. It's like, oh, whew, that's kind of getting me right now. Oh, I just want to be with you. I just want to see your face. I just want to talk with you. I just want to hang with you. And that little homesick feeling begins to activate us, to initiate us into the turning process. And how many of you, uh, by raising of hands, have been in a big crowd and, oh, everybody's having a blast and they're just having a, just a good old time and something inside of you says, but this ain't cutting it. This is not satisfying. You want something so much more real and, and deep. And that little tug, says, just as soon as this is over, I am the quickest way, the quickest way I can find myself alone with you. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I was out at a wedding, uh, what do you call it, reception one time. It was a kind of a big deal and everybody gathered around and it was going to be all day. And I tell you what, I knew of an alone place out on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. And, uh, and so I just said, you know what, time out, time out to the world, time out. I'm going to this alone place on the top of a bluff. And I'm going to look out over God's horizon. And I'm going to let my heart, my soul escape into just his presence, into the warmth of just, it's just me and you, Jesus. I turned aside just for me and you. Oh, I tell you, that's going to mess me up if we're not careful. <laughs> Very good.
Isn't it interesting that it's not the complex things that are usually the most effective for us. It's, mm -hmm. it's usually the most simplest of things. It's the things that are, that take no brain power. Rather, they take the spirit power. They, our spirit man gets to be fully energized, fully brought to the surface, activated as our leader at that moment. And so our brain is uh, only minimally engaged, <laughs> hopefully not distracting us at all, and lets our soul and spirit man just step right in. Awesome. So I'm looking through my Bible right now, and you've probably heard me say this, but in the Bible I have this little three by five card, and on it I have about 12 or 13 things that I call my on-ramps. So if one day I find myself a little cool, dusty, a little crusty, a little unfeeling, a little callous, you, you understand any of those words? I pull this out because something about these 12 or 13 things, some of them are scripture verses some of them are experiences I've had one of them is a daydream that became so real to me that when I revisit it it messes me up so I call them my on-ramps because I don't know about you but I don't always wake up uh, with my uh, most intimate uh, uh, thoughts and uh, and feelings all activated in my life. It, maybe you guys don't have those experiences, but <laughs> but what do you do when you say, well, I want to turn, but I don't have anything to turn with. I don't feel like I can flick the switch. I pull out my on-ramps. Now these are, I started this about 20 years ago, and now I have a lot more than this, but I keep this for reference. Many, many times when I have found myself ready to minister or about to minister in a church or a group or something and I have felt cool, kind of callous, kind of just dry. It's like, Lord, Lord, I do not, this is not okay to be, to minister in that kind of frame of mind and soul. And so... I'll pull this out and I'll get away by myself and I'll just say, Lord, could I just talk through one of these? Lord, do you remember this time? Do you remember when we did this? And do you remember what happens? And then I just kind of begin telling the story to God. And mostly I'm telling the story to myself because I don't think God needs to be reminded. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm refreshing my heart with those moments that are predictably tenderizing. Ooh, that's a good word, tenderizing. Who, here you go. Which one do you like? A cold, stony heart or a tender heart? Which one do we like? <laughs> well, obviously the tender heart. So uh, highlight, journal, document, establish what your turning practices are, what your turning methods are, so that you can revisit them without having to reinvent them or try to rediscover them somewhere in the future when you're not on a really good day. Find a way Get your little three by five going or however it works for you and write those down. Some of these are scripture verses. And, uh, oh, this is, uh, this is one right here. This is Luke 13, 32. And I don't know how this is going to work today, but when I can dial down and just be really intimate with the Lord, uh, each of these will mess me up but this is 
the two that were on the road to Emmaus. Their hero, <laughs> there it is, their hero, Jesus, died. Their hero was gone. And they were commiserating. They're like, what do we do now? What's to be done now? What's our future now? Our hero is gone. Jesus got murdered. He's in the tomb. What are we going to do? And they're walking along and along comes a man that they don't recognize. And he begins opening up the scripture. All that they were talking about. He makes it so clear to them. Their eyes of understanding about the scriptures were enlightened and it's like yes would you have dinner with us yes I will this stranger said and when they finished dinner he opened their eyes and he was gone it says immediately he was gone and it said then their response was oh did not our hearts burn within us the object of their affections, the one who they thought they had lost, their hero was gone. And then he came without them even knowing. He warmed their hearts, enlightened their minds, and then he let them know that it was him. Their desire, the one who they desired, was the one doing the enlightening. It's like, did, our, did not our hearts burn within us? So. I don't know why, but that and a 12 or 13 other ones on this piece of paper just have almost always the same predictable effect. <laughs> Revisiting those special moments can be another one of those ways. Let me give a context for this, uh, why this is important, and then we'll listen to one more person share how you turn. So you might ask, so why is this important? What is this in relationship to? And I believe it has everything to do with learning to live in the heavenly places. It has everything to do. Uh, scripture says, um, uh, oh, I'm going to murder this verse. Some of you got to help me with it. But whatever is born of the mind or the carnal mind leads to death. And whatever is born of the Spirit leads to life. Now, you guys have to help me there. But uh, the point is, my brain is not sufficient to take me to heaven, nor to lead me through heaven. I must have the capacity, the skill, even the fine-tuned skill, of learning how to feel the very vespers, the nuances of his presence. And I must train myself to be a good responder to that. Those, my friends, those skills will, I believe, put us in good stead or serve us very well when we get into the heavenly places. Because we're going to come into things and encounter situations and personages in the heavenly places that our brain will not be able to understand. And if our brain is the only skill that we have developed, then I believe we'll be sadly lacking and potentially open to some, some error. And I believe that, so we have to have our spirit man finally sensitized and skilled at discerning what it is that's here in front of us. Scripture says, strong meat is for those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to know good and or evil. And so uh, having our senses exercised, in that case now we're not talking about our carnal mind, I believe we're talking about our spiritual senses. Okay, so why is, why is this topic important? As I say, I think it's got everything to do with traversing through the heavenly places.